Muslim Brotherhood radicals being brought into the government as advisors on Islamist extremism, don't laugh. And on the site of the Olympic Village, the 2012 Olympics, which are going to be held in Britain, when Britain showcases itself to the world, on the site of the Olympic Village, the largest mosque in Europe is to be built, symbolizing the dominance in Britain of Islam. And this mosque is to be financed by the Tablighi Jama'at, said by French intelligence and the FBI to be the biggest recruiters to Al-Qaeda in Europe. Now, why is Britain getting all this so grievously wrong? Very briefly. It's because for decades its intelligentsia and political class have hollowed out British identity and values, creating a vacuum which is being exploited by radical Islamism. Britain has not only lost belief in itself as a nation, but European liberals in general have turned against the very idea of the nation itself. Rooted in the particulars of uh, history, religion, law, language, tradition, and so forth, the nation is seen as the cause of all the ills in the world from prejudice to war. Because it is particular, it excludes. Because it excludes, it is illegitimate, it is racist, it is discriminatory. That's why supranational institutions, such as the United Nations, the European Union, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, and the international and human rights law which they have invented are held to be more legitimate than the structures of individual democracies. Likewise, Britain's own culture has to give way to multiculturalism. Those wishing to uphold discrete and particular British national identity based on the particular values of that culture are vilified as racists. Some of them are. Most of them are not. They are instead merely Democrats who want to uphold their democratic right to express their own culture, a right uh, as assumed for centuries to be uh, just one of those things that cultures do. They want to express themselves in how they govern themselves. But instead, people in Britain are told this must be replaced by a doctrine whose key tenet is that the values of every powerless mi minority group must be afforded equal status to those of the majority. This is the key driver of multiculturalism. It's mul people might think multiculturalism is simply a kind of synonym for being tolerant and being, being, being nice to people of different faiths and different cultures and getting along. We should all subscribe to that. That's not in dispute or shouldn't be in dispute. That's not multiculturalism. The core point about multiculturalism is that minority values have equal status to those of the majority. And what that means is that minority values, and I'm talking not just about Islam, I'm talking about sexual, racial, ethnic, religious minorities, that minority values are turned into a weapon against the very concept of normative majoritarian values. And so with multiculturalism, there cannot be any longer a majority culture at all. To impose such a doctrine of multiculturalism and then to vilify those who dare protest, in my view, since multiculturalism is a recipe for destroying a culture, to impose such a doctrine and to vilify those who protest is simply a recipe for national suicide. But multiculturalism has produced in particular two lethal effects. First of all, it's left all immigrants abandoned and none more lethally so than young British Muslims. For if there is no longer an overarching culture, there is nothing into which minorities can integrate with the best will in the world. There's nothing there. And in particular, many young Muslims who are stranded between the backward Asian village life of their parents, on the one hand, and the drug, alcohol, and sex-saturated decadence that passes for Western civilization in Britain on the other, they are filled with disgust and with self-disgust if they go in for the drugs, alcohol, and sex. And thus, they are vulnerable to the predatory jihadis who are recruiting in the youth clubs, in the prisons, and on campus, who promise such young Muslims self-respect and a purpose to their lives based on holy war. Second terrible effect, and worse still, multiculturalism has reversed the notions of truth and lies, victim and victimizer. The theory goes like this, since minorities can basically do no wrong because they are essentially the victims of the majority, and by this light, the third world is one great minority which can do no wrong because the capitalist West has victimized it. 
Since minorities can do no wrong, they cannot be held responsible for wrong acts such as suicide bombings, which must instead be the fault of their victims, who are in fact their oppressors, if you can follow this argument. This key confusion, which has caused intellectual and moral paralysis in the West, plays more, e even more lethally than this, it plays directly into the pathological Muslim victim culture, which makes dialogue with them impossible, because Muslims genuinely believe they are under attack by the West, which is, they think, a giant conspiracy to destroy Islam. So they represent their own aggression as legitimate self-defense, and they represent the, the West's legitimate self-defense as aggression. This fundamental untruth, this fundamental inversion of truth and lies, which, in my view, incidentally lies at the very heart of Israel's difficulties with the Arab world, has created a dialogue of the demented. But instead of treating it as such, instead of treating it as the mad discourse that it is and refusing to play along with it, Britain regards it as an extension of its own minority rights doctrine, which routinely reverses victim and aggressor. So the untruths driving Muslim terror are merely deepened by the general discourse in Britain, particularly since the British left, which controls the, na the, 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 the nation's culture, demonizes America and Israel. The result is that the central Islamist perception of the big and little Satan, America and Israel, is actually echoed in mainstream British discourse, where anti-Americanism is now of epidemic proportions, and Israel is well on the way to being delegitimized altogether. This acts in turn as an echo chamber for Muslim prejudice, reinforcing it and fueling the sense of paranoia and victimization which is driving the terror. And it has also released the virus of Judeophobia in Britain, with the trope of the global Jewish conspiracy putting the world at risk, now a staple of mainstream discourse in the media. This virulent irrationality has brought together in Britain both left and right. The left, anti-America and pro-third world, puts the blame for Islamist terror on America, Israel, and the war in Iraq. The right, isolationist stability fetishists who think the world is full of dangerous foreigners who would leave us alone if only we don't upset them, blames America, Israel, and the war in Iraq. What all these people in Britain fail to grasp is that the Jews are indeed central to Islamist terror, but in quite the opposite way to what they think. The work of Syed Qutub, the principal ideologue of modern Islamism, holds that not only is the West conspiring to destroy Islam, but that the Jews are a metaphysical cosmic evil who are the puppet masters of the West. So anti-Jewishness is actually central to the jihad. That's why, in my view, Israel has such iconic status in the Islamist pantheon. In other words, Israel's fight is the West's own fight. If Israel goes down, the West goes with it. But Britain and Europe don't see it that way at all. They think Israel is the cause of the problem, a view greatly reinforced, I have to tell you, by the contributions of the Israeli left, whose revisionism and cognitive dissonance feed the venom in the British universities and media. That's why we have in Britain 1930s-style appeasement, the demonization of Israel, and resurgent anti-Jewish hatred. This, in turn, is now causing the West to falter in its defense of the free world. In Britain, America, and I believe in Israel too, we see a collapse of nerve along with a vacuum in political leadership. In Britain, a recent poll showed that most people thought President Bush was a greater threat to world peace than Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. The biggest danger to the West is the climate of defeatism, appeasement, and cultural collapse now on display for all the Islamist world to see. Since Londonistan, my book Londonistan was published last summer, there has been a shift in British thinking. We've had various events, such as the discovery of the transatlantic uh, bomb plot, which you may have briefly read about, uh, the, the, uh, the, the suggestion that up to 12 transatlantic uh, uh, airliners were going to be blown up simultaneously. Uh, so that's actually focused people's minds quite a lot. The idea that the 7-7 bombers were simply a group of uh, uh, rather silly boys who were going in for a bit of copycat suicide bombing, you know, the way young people do, which is the kind of thing that Britons told themselves, and they were only upset because of the war in Iraq, and after all, who could, who could disagree with that? 
suddenly the discovery of this transatlantic bomb plot with possibly hundreds and hundreds of Al-Qaeda people <coughs> around the world being involved made people think that possibly their theory had a few holes in it. So there's been a bit of a shift, and there have been other things too. We actually had a debate last autumn about whether it was right for Muslim women to wear the full-face niqab veil in, uh, public, uh, in public places. Uh, this caused a tremendous sensation that we were actually having a debate about an Islamist practice. We all felt very brave. That was before we discovered that a prime male suspect with the murder of a police officer had walked unchallenged through Heathrow Airport and escaped to Somalia because he was wearing such a veil. Tony Blair's government has now realized that its strategy of appeasement has been a disaster, but it doesn't know what to do instead. Mr. Blair made a speech recently telling Muslims to adapt to British ways or get out. We all sat up and took notice. But then he went on to endorse multiculturalism, which he appeared to think just meant being nice to people of different backgrounds. Oh dear. So what should be done? Very simply this. We all have to grasp that terrorism is not the biggest threat we face. The biggest threat is the ideology that drives it. It's not enough to fight terror, vital though that is. The principal battleground is actually the world of ideas. The Islamists understand this extremely <coughs> well. They understand that if they can hijack the human mind to the cause of hatred and lies, they have an army. And if they can further hijack the minds of their victims, they will win. In Britain, the minds of their victims are well on the way to being thus hijacked. The Islamists understand that psychological warfare, the fermenting of paranoia, of resentment, of hysteria, and demoralization, that this kind of warfare is their most effective weapon. We're not even on the same page. We haven't even understood that this is where the battleground is. If you talk about Islamist ideas, you're received with shrieks of racism, prejudice, bigotry, Islamophobia, and the debate is promptly shut down. The liberal West, which worships at the shrine of reason and makes such a fetish of the power of the intellect, does not understand that ideas can kill. As a result, Britain, Europe, America, and Israel have all left the battleground of ideas totally undefended, allowing the unhindered advance of falsehood and hatred. Worse still, our intelligentsia and media often are acting now as the Islamists' fifth column. It is only if we act against the ideology that is spreading this falsehood and this hatred and stop its advance <coughs> under the convenient umbrella of minority rights that we have any chance of defending the free world adequately. That means that while we must certainly show respect to Muslims who derive spiritual sustenance from their faith, we must also reassert Western values. We must say that Muslims, like any other minority, are welcome to practice their faith and form communities of faith in our countries on the same terms that we give everyone else, which means that where their values conflict with the overarching values of the West, or of the host countries, the overarching values, freedom of speech, women's rights, <coughs> monogamy, not polygamy, whatever, that those values actually win. So we have to reassert Western values, and we have to resist any attempts to subvert them. It also means facing down in public the lies spread about Israel and the West. Only if we stop deluding ourselves and take this kind of action, which is necessary for our survival, will I suggest, I suggest that it's only in this way that we will stop this sleepwalking to defeat. Thank you.